in East Jerusalem, the small Palestinian neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah is emblematic of the tensions. After years of legal battles in the Israeli courts, some Palestinian families who have lived here for decades and been granted residency, but not Israeli citizenship, were given eviction orders. Jewish settlers alleging that they were living on properties owned by Jews before the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. This sparked protests amongst Palestinians who make up 40% of the population in Jerusalem but who have little say on how the city is governed. Tensions rose throughout the Islamic holy month of Ramadan and culminated at the Al-Aqsa Mosque complex in Jerusalem's old city next to the holiest site in Judaism, Temple Mount. This place with huge religious and national significance was where thousands of worshippers at last Friday's prayers were met with a heavy Israeli police presence. Amidst the rockets fired by Palestinian militant groups and airstrikes by the Israeli military, confrontations between Israeli forces and Palestinians have been far-reaching. After rioting by Israeli Arabs, Palestinians who have been granted Israeli citizenship, a state of emergency was declared in the city of Lod. Our foreign affairs correspondent Jonathan Rugman has the latest. Dawn in Gaza, the Islamic holiday at the end of Ramadan. Shattered by airstrikes on a building Israel says belongs to Hamas. This is either the precursor to invasion or a short, sharp shock so that one is deemed not required. Palestinians walked dazed among the rubble on a day when they would usually be shopping or eating out. No chance of that in this street now. <laughs> Further south in Khan Yunis, the funeral of an 11-year-old boy and his 13-year-old cousin. 18 children have been reported killed so far. To the Israelis, they were human shields used by Hamas. To the Palestinians, their deaths are just the latest violation of international law. Israel says it has killed 16 Hamas commanders and some of them were buried today. The group has asked for a ceasefire, which suggests it thinks it's won the propaganda war. Its rockets have been fired further and with greater intensity than ever before even though they're made of irrigation pipes and fertilizer and at risk of running out. Hamas has shown it can spread terror across Israeli cities. The decision to bomb Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Dimona, Ashkelon, Ashdod and Beersheba is easier for us than drinking water. In Petah Tikva, a city east of Tel Aviv, evidence of Hamas's reach and that Israel's Iron Dome defences can't stop every attack. Five people were hurt. This man in the same building was watching the conflict on the news when suddenly he became part of it. In Sidorot, which is close to Gaza, a five-year-old Israeli boy was killed. And even if both sides do step back from the brink of all-out war, listen to this neighbour demanding the opposite. It's very, very difficult to live uh, under these uh, uh, circumstances. And uh, the government should wipe out Gaza, should wipe out Gaza once and for all. It's going to happen again many, many times. The government should wipe out Gaza. These pictures released by Israeli police show Palestinian Arabs rioting in the central Israeli city of Lod. It's a coup for extremists on both sides if Arab and Jewish communities begin falling apart. How can they pray in the mosque and then lynch people, this man asks an Arab passing by. We need to live together, comes the Arab's answer. That's even harder when Palestinian youths are filmed attacking an Orthodox Jew in Jerusalem after no peace talks for years and no peace plan worth the name. This was the Victory Ice Cream Parlour south of Tel Aviv, owned by Christian Arabs and ransacked by a Jewish mob. This polarisation is not years, but decades in the making. And to Benjamin Netanyahu's critics, it gives the lie to his claim that he can keep his country safe. 
Israel's longest-serving prime minister was today meeting soldiers and inspecting Iron Dome missile batteries. Until now, he's been unable to form a coalition. The man they call Mr. Security is seeking a route back to power. We will continue striking Hamas while defending our citizens. It will take more time, but with great firmness in offence as well as defence, we will achieve our goal of bringing back calm to the State of Israel. This crisis seems to have benefited Hamas so far. You can see it in the compound of Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque, where worshippers marked the end of Ramadan beneath the group's banner because it was Hamas which made Israel answer for firing rubber bullets across this holy ground on Monday. In Gaza, they are praying that Egypt might broker a peace. But 9,000 Israeli reservists were called up today, and history shows that Israel won't stop unless Palestinian rockets stop flying first. Jonathan Ruckman, now, what has the response been then from the United States? Our Washington correspondent, Siobhan Kennedy, is at the White House. Siobhan. And then... Well, John, Joe Biden has been criticised, including by Democrats, for not doing enough so far. Like all US presidents, though, he's treading a very delicate line given the close relationship between the US and Israel. He doesn't want to be seen to be overstepping the mark. He has stressed that the US is working with partners, with Egypt and Tunisia in the region, to try and bring about peace. But rather controversially, earlier on in a press conference, he said that he had not seen, in his words, a significant overreaction in the response from Israel. This after we know he had a conversation yesterday with the Prime Minister, Mr Netanyahu, and he stressed to him too that Israel had a right to defend itself and appeared not to criticise Israel for what many see as a disproportionate reaction thus far in Gaza. Well, earlier I asked the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, if she believed that Joe Biden in the US simply wasn't doing enough. I think the president took the appropriate, proportionate uh, response to it all. Uh, the fact is, is that we have a very close relationship with Israel, and Israel's security is a national security issue for us as our friend, a democratic country in the region. Uh, but there is a Palestinian power struggle, and this is about Hamas. So I wouldn't just label it Palestinian. I would say Hamas. And Hamas is threatening the security of people in Israel. Israel has a right to defend itself. Uh, many of our members in our caucus who are great friends of Israel, but understand uh, also that we respect the self-determination, that we want a two-state solution in the region. But that doesn't give license uh, to Hamas to bomb Israel. Earlier I spoke with Mahous Husseini a human rights campaigner in Gaza City. And I started by asking her what it was like living under fire. Well, actually, it has been uh, one of the harshest nights. Not yesterday, uh, the Israeli occupation has been targeting several places all at the same time. They have been using more than 100 missiles all at the same time, targeting several places across the Gaza Strip. Actually, I haven't slept for the past days except for a few minutes because uh, the uh, bumping suffice at night. Uh, so it has a very, been a very tough night. I understand that you have your bags packed, but where could you go? We have already packed our bags. I'm not sure where we can go. It depends on the situation. Actually, uh, maybe uh, it depends on where Israel would target. Has it been a bit better today or, or just as bad as the previous days? I'm not sure if you hear it, but there are uh, far bombings out there. Yeah, we can't say that it, it's getting any calmer. Maha Husseini, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. And stay safe, please. And a short while ago, from the Israeli city of Lod, I spoke to the Israeli photojournalist Oren Zub, and I asked him what he witnessed last night in Lod. And we apologize for the awful quality, but understandably bad quality, of the connection. So in Lod, we are seeing in the last day tension between Palestinian uh, Arab residents of Lod and Israeli settlers, right-wing settlers, mostly coming from the West Bank in recent years and living here. The tension started for many different reasons. First of all, the solidarity protest with Al-Aqsa, but later also the police behavior and the fact that the Israeli men opened, fired and killed a Palestinian Arab man 
we fly fire here in Lod. This led to a huge explosion that we saw across Israel in many Arab Palestinian cities. And youth that I'm talking to are saying that this is not just for Al Aqsa or for the police brutality. This blew up everything: the poverty, the house uh, demolition, the racism, the systematic discrimination this youth so this is not something we've seen before just a political act but of course it's political but it's also frustrations of years of the discrimination from the municipality to the police to the general government i've been a journalist for 15 years and i've been covering things in the west bank in the gaza border inside israel such a wave of violence between citizens palestinian citizens of israel and israeli jew including lynches burning cars uh, this wave of violence we never saw I've also been speaking with Khaled El-Gindi, an author on Palestinian-Israeli affairs who has participated in previous attempts at negotiations. And I asked him what he thinks of the role of the United States so far in this crisis. Well, the United States, uh, I think the Biden administration was not all that keen on taking this issue up uh, as a priority uh, when it first began uh, a few months ago. But now, of course, with this crisis, uh, they have no choice but to uh, to engage. The question is, uh, at what level uh, are they engaging and at what level of urgency? Uh, from, from what I can tell, um, I'm not sure that they have uh, the, the level of urgency that is required to, uh, to bring this to a quick end. And what would that measure be? What have they got to do to bring it to a quick end? Well, I think for starters, the language that they're using is uh, sort of blanket language that effectively gives the Israeli side a, a green light. I think adopting a laissez-faire uh, attitude toward uh, Israeli military operations is, uh, is not what's needed. Um, uh, I, I think a much more robust uh, assertion that this needs to be brought to an end. The United States has considerable influence with Israel, but it's not really using that influence at the moment. But that addresses Israel. It doesn't address the Palestinian militants. Right. I mean, uh, on that, the United States has no influence. Um, there are other parties talking to Hamas, uh, the Egyptians, other regional actors. But at, at this stage, you know, we can't forget the, the, the enormous asymmetry that exists here between the two sides. Israel is the strongest military in the region. Uh, the Palestinians are probably the weakest. And so the, the onus really is, on the, I think, on the more powerful side. And that includes both Israel and the United States. From the language that we're hearing, do you think there is a serious danger of massive escalation and very serious consequences? I do. I mean, we're, we're hearing about an imminent ground invasion uh, by the Israeli army. I think that will be disastrous, frankly, for, for both sides. Um, we've seen this in the past. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think when, when, the, when ground forces go in, usually mass casualties follow. Mr. El-Gindi, thank you very much indeed for talking with us. Thank you.